you have your Bibles, open to Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians chapter number 6. I'm excited to begin a new series this morning. I will not finish the whole series today, so don't get worried. The new series I've entitled, uh, I'm entitled really Power Verses. Some familiar verses I'm going to preach through the next few weeks. And some of you will know these verses quite well. If you've been in our Christian school, you've memorized some of these verses, maybe even multiple times. But have you ever been struck by the fact that often what we know we forget? And I've said this and I'll say it again, that often our problem, my problem is not a knowing problem, not that we don't know the truth, it's a doing problem. It's not typically typical that we'll come to church and, and hear some brand new truth that we never, ever, ever heard before. Now, sometimes that, ha that happens, and that's wonderful. But normally what happens is this. You come to church, or you're reading your Bible, or you're praying. And when God touches your heart, it's about something that you already know you've just not been doing. It's not a knowing problem, it's a doing problem. So these, this particular series of verses are some verses that will be quite familiar to some. To some people, these will be brand new verses, and that's wonderful because these are great, great verses. Every verse in the Bible is good, but there are some nuggets in there. There are some things that you can hold on to at certain times in your life or certain things that will challenge you that are just, man, first class top. And, and some of these verses that I've tried to identify throughout Scripture, I want to look at those and study those as a church family. I want to challenge us again and afresh and anew with these concepts. And as I begin on these verses, you may say, well, Pastor Howell, I, I could finish quoting that verse for you. Well, praise the Lord, I'll ask you this question, are you living it though? I, I frankly, I don't think the Lord cares if we know it, if we're not doing it. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. See, once you know these things, we're responsible for them. We have a responsibility to now do what God has asked us to do. Galatians chapter 6 is, is the passage of, this, of the first set of verses I'd like to look at. Familiar to a lot of us in here. And Galatians is, is written as a book to, to Christians, the brethren. We find that in chapter 1, some of those early verses. And deals largely in the book about living a, a sanctified life or a, a life before the Lord. Not a life of, of legalism, all right, a life where we have to do, 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 but a life of how we please Jesus Christ. Now understand something, as I please Jesus Christ, there will be some things I do and some things I don't. Let me say that again. As I live a life that pleases Jesus Christ, there are some things that I will do to please Jesus and some things I won't do to please Jesus. We, we do not live in a time where everything is, is acceptable, though that is a common misconception. That, hey, no matter what you do, as long as it's before the Lord, it's okay. Well, as I read my Bible, I find there's some things that aren't okay. But Jesus says, don't do this, and, and do do this. We come to Galatians chapter number 6, toward the end of the, ver, toward the, end of the book, and, and Paul is now beginning to wrap up this book. And in verses 7, 8, and 9, he gives us a familiar passage, a familiar principle, but a truth I'd like to look at this morning. And the Bible says this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word, the book that you've given to us. Lord, I thank you for this particular truth, this law of sowing and reaping. Lord, I'd ask that you'd help me this morning to present the truth in a way that would be challenging and uplifting to you. Lord, our hearts would be turned towards you. And Lord, I pray that if there are ways and areas of our heart and life that do not please you in regards to this specific truth, Lord, that you would touch us, that you would change us, and that we'd respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. There are some preachers out there, and, and in some way, I envy them a little bit, but they have these great background stories. I grew up as a, as a farmer, right? They'll talk about the days they're getting up at 3 in the morning to, to melt cows and, and then plant, you know, 14 million acres of whatever they're planting. You've heard these stories before, right? And you're like, wow, I could never identify with that because I grew up in a, in a suburban home. I got to cut the grass. And when it grew again, I cut it again. I never milked a single cow in my life, nor do I have a desire to milk a cow in my life. 
if you milk cows, that's wonderful, I'll let you milk them. I didn't grow up with 14 million acres. In fact, we had, for most of my life, about an acre and three quarters. Two cars, 3.2 kids, not really seven kids, the American dream. But this particular truth references a farming concept, does it not? It reminded me of our, our first house that my wife and I purchased together, the house that she bought before we were married that I had never seen, but she bought for us. That's another story for another time. See, now you'll come back to church and hear that story. And in the backyard, I decided to grow some tomato plants. I don't have a green thumb. I've never been a farmer. I probably should never be a farmer. But I found a spot that I thought would be wonderful, and I planted in about two feet wide by about 10 feet long, about 10 tomato plants. Well, now why do you laugh? Because you think I'm an idiot. Fair enough. Put these tomato plants in the ground, and, and wouldn't you know it, these tomato plants took off. They absolutely flourished. They became humongous because little did I realize that where I planted these tomato plants was very close to a septic line. <laughs> Who knew? I didn't have to water these tomato plants. I didn't have to fertilize them. They grew all by themselves. And they grew massive. They grew <laughs> so big that we had dead tomatoes all on the ground. We couldn't pick enough to keep up on the, just the two of us with these 10 tomato plants. The next year I got smart, so I planted less tomato plants. They grew even bigger. <laughs> Look at that. I can grow things when I plant on top of a septic line. <laughs> but you know what's funny is that I never got pineapples out of tomato plants. That's weird, isn't it? That's odd. Never got any blueberries, and I, I love blueberries. Never got any asparagus, and I, I love asparagus. Now, I have to be careful saying these things because now all of you will bring me all of your asparagus, and I only need a little bit of asparagus, not a lot of asparagus, but I love it. And here the Bible teaches us a principle of sowing and reaping. We're going to look at this passage, if we can, and break it apart into a few ways. I want to look at, first of all, an exhortation. An exhortation. The Bible says this in the first two phrases, be not deceived, God is not mocked. I'd say this first of all, watch out for the scam. Don't get turned around and upside down. You know that it is easy to be tricked. Now we don't like to admit that, but it is easy to get tricked. A few years back I was refing a soccer game, the privilege of refing high school soccer, and, and you may or may not know soccer, but if the ball goes out of bounds on the end line and the um, defending team kicks it out, it's what's called the corner kick. The corner kick goes in the corner of the field, hence the name corner kick, all right? And on a corner kick, a player must kick it and cannot touch it again until another player touches it. So that's the kind of play, and I'd blown the whistle, and the defending team had kicked it out as a corner kick, and so these guys lined up for the corner kick, and, and um, the one guy went there and said, you know what, I'm not going to kick it, and ran back, and, and the next guy came in and started dribbling it, which is an illegal play. Well, the other team is all up in arms. Hey, wait, what's going on? Oh, and all of a sudden, the guy kicks and almost scores. Well, come to find out, the first team had pulled what's called a trick play. The first guy had gone there to the corner, and he had pretended to take the kick. But what he had done is just rolled the ball one revolution forward. If the ball moves at all, the ball is now in play. Anyone could have gotten it. He rolled it forward just one little moment, just one little movement, just rolled it forward and said, you know what, I'm not going to kick this ball. He wasn't, and he did it. The other team didn't realize the ball was in place, so as he ran away, they could have gone after the ball, but they thought it was still dead ball. So when the other player went up to it, it was a live ball. Tricked everybody. Tricked the fans. Tricked me as a referee. They're like, hey, you're supposed to know that stuff. I said, I am, but you tricked me. We don't like to be tricked. You like to be tricked? I don't like to be tricked. A few years back, we had gone down on a vacation and went to one of those, those um, places where you got to sit through a timeshare selling spiel. You've sat through some of these as well, haven't you? Boy, that's a hard sell, isn't it? It is hard to get out of there in one piece with your wallet intact. And man, they try every, in that particular time, with my wife and I, they tried every technique known to man. 
I mean, I feel like they were grabbing my ankles on the way out and trying to pull me back in the room like that. I've heard of stories of people getting tricked in a, in a bad way. Now, not all those are scams. Not all of them are, but, but some obviously are less scrupulous than other ones. And I read about recently a, a couple who had been, who had been shammed by, by one of those spiels. No one likes to get tricked. And it's interesting that Paul would begin these verses with this little phrase, don't get tricked, be not deceived. It must mean that there's a potential to be deceived in this concept. It must mean that, that there's going to be some things out there that if we're not careful will deceive us or will trick us about this exact truth that seems to be very plain, but must mean that there are some things that are hidden inside of it. He says, do not be deceived. Don't be deceived. Be careful. There's going to come people that tell you that you can beat the system. Don't be deceived. God's way is always the right way. There are going to be some ideas out there. Listen, you don't have to live this way and you can still end up all right. Paul says, listen, don't be deceived. It won't happen. And then he says this, God is not mocked. Don't no, watch out for the scam. Watch out for the sneer. But when I looked up this concept, God is not mocked. The idea is that someone has turned their nose up at God himself. That they have looked at the Almighty in the idea of this, these words in his face and said, in essence, forget you. What a scary place to be. The creator of the universe, the one who rules over all, the one who gives us life and holds us together, the one who has saved us and we can worship him. How terrible it would be to look at him and say, I don't care about you. The sneer. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. There are times that, that as you work with young people in the school, Every once in a while, you'll have a, a child with a bad attitude, believe it or not. Remember a few years back, there was a young child, and it kind of caught me off guard. You see, when I was principal, as principal, you kind of get a certain level of respect. You walk into a room, and, and normally people sit there and like, Psh, sit right up. But, but this particular child was a very young elementary student, and they were basically looking at me and saying, forget you. And I'm, I remember kind of thinking, forget in my mind, who are you? You're like this tall. I could squash you. No, I won't. Right? We've seen that before. Maybe you've seen it or have had it, have had it happen to you. Can you imagine doing that to the creator of the universe? It, we're, we are blessed that God does not respond like we are apt to respond. He must think, I could squash you. And he could. But the Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. You see, the, the thing is this, this truth is inescapable. You can say, God, I don't think that what your way is right way. It doesn't matter, God's not mocked. His way is right. He always wins. You can say, I don't believe this truth. It doesn't matter, it's still true. You can not believe in the law of gravity. It doesn't change the fact that you will fall if you jump. You can say, I deny it. I reject it. Wonderful. Jump off the building. Let me know how that goes, go, goes for you. And this truth is an exhortation. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. This truth is inescapable. And then I see, though, an explanation. He says this, here's the truth. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You see, we, I see a couple of things. We reap what we sow. What we plant always grows. And when I was young, we played with army men. And you know what? If you plant the army men in the ground, nothing happens. Yet my tomato plants grew. Most of us could use more money at times, right? But what if you plant your dollar bills in the ground? What's going to happen? They're going to get dirty. Will you come out the next morning and have a dollar bill tree? Oh, I wish. I plant that on the septic line all day long. <laughs> Wouldn't you? You come to my, you'd be my best friend. I guarantee it. Y yet, yet we think that everything we do will be reproduced. We think we can beat the system. We think, you know what? I can do, make these choices right here and I will not reap this over here. 
You see, in life, there are certain things that will not, or, or, or in, in a physical life, there are certain things that will not grow in the ground, objects. But in our lives, our spiritual lives, everything we do is a seed that's planted. Every choice that I make, every choice that you make, it, we're either planting for good things or planting for, 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 for the bad things. Everything we do, sowing and reaping, we, we sow by our choices that we make. I find it with children that, that children re repeat and reproduce what you do. We've gone to my brother's wedding, my wife and I, taking a young lady with us. My wife sometimes get a, gets a little bit nervous about our children being stolen. All right, and there's that idea out there. We'd gone into an airport. So on the way into the airport, my, my wife had, had instructed my son, Johnny. She said, listen, Johnny, um, if someone grabs you that's not me, I want you to yell at the top of your lungs, you're not my mommy. And she said, that's good, yeah. And uh, so Johnny, I think it was about four at this time, younger child, and okay, you know, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, okay. So, you know, someone's grabbing you, you're not my mommy, you're not my mommy. We're in the Dallas airport. Dallas Airport, we kind of walked down. Security was way down here. And all of a sudden, Johnny took off running. Four-year-old. I was um, holding James. He might have been three. I was holding James. James was real young. And, and, uh, and my wife had two Starbucks drinks in her hands. And so she was unable to move as well. And so we had a little Chelsea Ferguson with us. And, and Chelsea goes, I'll run, go grab Johnny. Well, even a four-year-old, them little legs can move quickly, Right? She runs after him, and, and he's just going out to the game, and he's just trucking. And she catches up with him right by the security. You know where this is going. And as she grabs him, he yells out at the top of his lungs, You're not my mommy! People looking at her, grabbing this child. She starts to yell back at him and have a discussion with him. I'm helping your mommy! You know, and clears him off, and they're watching all the way back down. Oh, kids, kids reproduce what we do and say, don't they? You hear them say something like, where did they learn that from? Oh, oh, they learned it from me. That's this idea that, that we reap what we sow, what we plant, we will, we will gain again. We always reap more than we sow. What we plant comes back, but it comes back fourfold, tenfold, a hundredfold. We always reap more than we sow. You see, we can say, well, it's just one decision. But in the truth of this, but in the fact of this truth, it may be one decision, but the consequences can be eternal for good and for bad. And we always reap after we sow. Always more, always later than we plan, and always in kind, but we always reap after, after we sow. In, in the second or first second grade, Mrs. Allen does this thing with, with grass seed. They put in a little, a little styrofoam cup. They put grass seed in there, and it's the hair that grows out of the cup. They draw a little face on there. My kids have loved that, and, and uh, they keep me updated on the progress of that particular grass hair, and they, I guess, cut it with scissors and, and give the, the little styrofoam guy a haircut. But boy, kids can be impatient, can't they? You plant it in water, and nothing happened. It's been 15 seconds. Where's the grass? No, no, sun and rain, and that's to germinate all that. Okay, okay. Is it here yet? You see, we always reap after we sow. Good and bad, it happens both ways. On, on the wicked side of things, you'll see people who seem to... to so a life of discord and a life of wickedness, and, and it, it seems like everything's going okay, but, but guess what? The Bible says that'll catch up to you. That'll catch up to you. But that being said, this is not just a bad truth. It's a good truth. As you sow to Jesus Christ in the Spirit, you reap the good and the eternal as well. We'll talk about that in just a minute. You see, the truth is invariable. We can control what we reap only by what we sow. We cannot change the consequences. We cannot change the results. We can only choose whether to sow here or sow here. But then after that, I see an illustration. In verse number 8, Paul says this, For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. 
There is this term in computers, it's, it's G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. The idea is that whatever you program this to be, that is what will come out. And if you program good information out, then when you, when you touch your computer, good things will come out. If you program bad things, then, then bad things will come out. The quality of the output is determined by the quality of the input. This is what this truth is talking about, that your life, the quality, will be determined by the input. So what are you inputting? When you wake up, are you inputting to yourself? Are you so into the flesh, eating what you want to eat and living like you want to live and doing what you want to do? Or are you trying to seek the mind of Jesus Christ so to the Spirit? Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, how do I make this decision? Lord, how do I respond in this situation? Lord, how do I treat this person who is just unkind to me? That's sowing to the Spirit. Lord, I just got this bonus at work. How do you want me to spend it? That's sowing to the Spirit. Lord, I've got to buy this right here. Which one should I do? That's sowing to the Spirit. If you sow to the Spirit, the Bible says, you shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. It's a missionary, Adoniram Judson, famous father of missions. He had this quote. He said, a life once spent is irrevocable. It will remain to be contemplated throughout eternity. The same may be said of each day, when it is once passed, it is gone forever. All the marks which we put upon it, it will exhibit forever. Each day will not only be a witness of our conduct, but will affect an everlasting. He understood that what we do, the truth, is incalculable. And he says, and at night, let us reflect that one more day is gone, and Della be marked forever. But then I see a consolation. Verse number 9, he says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Interesting that verse number 9 comes after 7 and 8 in, in the sense of that, that he says, don't be deceived and don't mock God and, and here's the truth, you're going to reap what you sow. Then he says, hey, hey, don't be weary, don't get discouraged. Now why would he say don't get discouraged? I believe he says don't get discouraged because sometimes it seems like what we're doing has no effect. That sometimes it seems like, Lord, I'm trying to please you, I'm, I'm trying to follow you, and, but, but it seems like everything's going bad. Have you ever felt that way before? Like the minute you try to do right, everything goes south. You're like, well, how can this be true? And Paul says, listen, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't quit now for in due season. It's time for the harvest. You will reap if you faint not. There's a consolation. You can do it. You can get it. And you can stick with it. Remember, Galatians talks about God's grace for us. It's not because we have some inner fortitude. It's not because we're amazing people, but because God in His grace allows us to serve Him. You see, we reap what we sow. The story is told about a frail old man who went to live with his son and daughter-in-law and their four-year-old grandson. The old man's hands trembled, his eyesight was blurred, and his steps faltered. The family always ate together at the table, but the elderly grandfather's shaky hands and failing sight made eating very difficult for him. The peas would roll off his spoon under the floor, and when he grasped the glass, milk spilled onto the tablecloth. Oh, his son and daughter-in-law became quite irritated with the mess. We, we must do something about my father, said the son. I've had enough of his spilled milk and noisy eating and food on the floor. So the husband and wife set a small table in the corner, and their grandfather ate alone while the rest of the family enjoyed their dinner. Since grandfather had also broken a dish or two, his food was served in a small wooden bowl. When the family glanced in grandfather's direction, sometimes he had a tear in his eye as he sat alone. Still, the only words that the couple had for him were sharp admonitions when he dropped a fork or spilled some food. The small four-year-old watched it all in silence. One evening before supper, the father noticed the son, his four-year-old, playing with 
some wood on the floor. He asked the child sweetly, the son, what are you making? And, and just as sweetly back, the boy responded, oh, I'm making a little bowl for you and mama to eat your food in when I grow up. <laughs> Four-year-old smiled and went back to work. And the words so struck the parents that they were speechless. The tears began to stream from his eyes, or from their cheeks and down their cheeks, and though no word was spoken, they knew it must be done. And that very evening, the husband and his wife took grandfather's hand and gently led him back to the family table. For the remainder of his days, he ate every meal with the family. And for some reason, neither husband nor wife ever seemed to care when a fork dropped or food was spilled or the tablecloth spoiled. You see, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You reap what you sow. So what are you sowing today? You're sowing to the flesh? You're making choices based on how you feel and reacting like you want? Or are you sowing to the Spirit? Are you saying, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that we can sow to you and plant to you and you will give us wonderful blessings. I wonder this morning, he would say, Pastor Howell, as you were speaking, God spoke to me. And while I may know or maybe never heard till today this truth before, God spoke to me and, and I need to stop sowing to my flesh. I've been allowing actions or thoughts or things to dominate me. Would you pray for me that I would focus and sow to the Spirit, make choices to, to sow to the Spirit? Would you pray for me with upraised hands and say, Pastor Al, that's me, you spoke to me this morning, would you pray for me? Amen. 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 I wonder if there's someone here this morning who would say, you know, Brother Howell, as you spoke, you talked about some of these things, but I've, I don't know that I've ever trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I never turned from my sin and asked Him to save me. Would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'll call no more attention to you than I did to them, but we'd love to pray for you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Say, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for those? Amen. I see that hand. We'd love to open a Bible and show you how we can know for sure.